everyone. We'll get back uh, back to our meeting. Ariel, you are up. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Brisbane City Council. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here to present to you. And good evening also to the people of Brisbane and to the other city officials that are here. Um, for this presentation and for this meeting. I'm really excited to present. And um, it's my first time presenting to the City Council. I started working with Mountain Watch <coughs> nine months ago, and um, it's really been an honor and an adventure to work in Brisbane and San Bruno Mountain. Mm -hmm. So I'm really happy to be here. And um, I'm the stewardship coordinator with, with San Bruno Mountain Watch. And so what that means is that I lead events for the public to um, volunteer in habitat restoration all over the mountain. Uh, to give you a quick taste of this week, which has been busy. Um, yesterday, I was on the dunes with some high schoolers. Today, I was in the bog, in the, in the saddle this morning. Tomorrow, I'll be leading a program at Buckeye Canyon, and Saturday, in the grasslands above South San Francisco. So I, I get to work all over the mountain. And, um, and uh, But on Tuesday, I was actually working in uh, Crocker Industrial Park in the frog habitat um, there on Cypress Lane. And so you might be wondering why when I'm working all over the mountain, why do I also work in um, this valley, Guadalupe Valley, and why am I so interested um, in this? And so I'm gonna present today on what I'm calling the um, Guadalupe Valley Trail Initiative. And um, so there's a whole history of how Mountain Watch got involved in that area, um, but I would like to share why it's, it's special to me and why I'm really happy to be involved there. Um, so here we go. <coughs> uh, the first obvious reason is that Guadalupe Valley is still uh, part of San Bruno Mountain. Obviously, it's, it's the valley because the hills and the peaks of the mountain rose around it to, to make it a valley. So I still feel strongly that it's, um, though Crocker Park is there now and it's the foundation for Crocker Park, it's still part of the uh, San Bruno Mountain environment. And also an another um, reason is that um, part of my my work and my job is not just to restore habitat on the mountain and, and the surrounding environment, but it is to connect people, uh, develop deep connections to the to the environment, to the mountain, and um, just taking a walk around the trail in this valley, uh, people see so many sites, have a lot of scenic views to San Bruno Mountain, and it's still a really amazing place where people can really connect with the mountain. Um, so this is a, just a historic image of, of the valley before Crocker Park. Um, and so here's a, a brochure from uh, the Crocker Land Company when they were advertising Crocker Industrial Park. Um, but you know, even though it's an industrial site now, uh, the other reason why it's so special is that being the mountain's valley, just like the mountain, it's still bursting with a lot of special life and a lot of life that is native to San Bruno Mountain. And so um, I'm gonna focus today on, I wanna start off, since this is a talk about a trail, I'm gonna start off uh, taking you on a short two minute walk uh, on what it's like to walk next to um, this little uh, ditch creek, as I call it, um, the ditch along the old train tracks that in the past uh, decade it was converted to a walking trail. Um, and so uh, the first obvious one is the most famous resident of this little area along Cypress Lane. It's the chorus frogs. Um, it, the Bay Area truly is having a chorus for our craze. There's backyard ponds popping up in backyards from San Jose to San Francisco and schools. Um, and I'd say Brisbane is the star of all of the chorus frog habitats. It's well known around the Bay as being a really good breeding area. And so you'll see some of those um, resting on a cattail. And there they are with uh, some different coloring as well. You can see they change their coloring according to different factors like climate, uh, temperature, um, to blend in pretty well. Um, here they are in their tadpole stage. This year was a wonderful year for the tadpoles because there was enough water. And um, here are some snakes that uh, actually these two young fellows found. And I love these pictures because you really see the look of uh, wonder and amazement in their faces and really feel like this is how young folks get to respect and fall in love with the environment is being up close and personal with it. Um, what kind of snake is that? Uh, they said it was a red-bellied racer. I'm not an expert on reptiles and I haven't verified that, but that young boy actually was really uh, super into reptiles and so I trust him. 
We used to call them, <laughs> <laughs> used to call them Texas ringnecks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, besides the frogs, we also have the birds. Here is um, a bird's nest. It's pretty much a work of art, I think, uh, tucked into a nice native coyote brush. Um, and here are the bees. So we got the birds, the bees. Here is a bee pollinating a native toyon shrub in bloom. And we have the butterflies. This isn't the Mission Blue butterfly, this is the Spring Azure. Um, in a sense, it's the Mission Blue's less famous cousin, um, but it does look like the Mission Blue, and uh, here it is kind of drinking, getting some moisture from the creek bank. Um, so the birds, the bees, the butterflies, and also amazing flora. So just in this two minute walk, I'm not gonna go through all the native plants that are here, but just what you might spot on a quick two minute uh, saunter through here. So this was just blooming last week. It's a wildflower called Farewell to Spring, and as we're saying goodbye to the spring, it's blooming. Um, native California aster, a great pollinator plant. Water parsley blooming up above the channel. And um, a nice view of rushes, tule reeds with some willow trees in the background. And so it gives you the feeling of this rural um, freshwater wetland. And so um, what I'm here to present on the trail initiative is really all about um, thinking a vision for how we can make these, uh, this trail going through this valley um, very meaningful, beautiful, a lively place that the public enjoys. Um, young folks, employees from Crocker Industrial Park who are um, having their lunch by these areas. Um, the people of Brisbane who jog or walk their dog along these areas. How do we make these educational, so beautiful, and really fun places quirky, um, that make the city of Brisbane really special? And so three aspects, environmental education, the Guadalupe Valley Stewards Program, and the Guadalupe Valley History Project that I'm gonna go into. So the first one is environmental education. Um, just in the past few months, I've led um, a few field trips for local schools like Whitman Middle School, and also um, a month-long service project for about six um, young students from Littman Middle School. And that's the card that they gave me. They came out for a month to do community service and help uh, take care of these habitats. And these are really wonderful places for education. You can go through all sorts of topics, whether it be climate change, for example, the amount of rain and the, the um, wh wh what time the rain falls affects when the frogs um, lay their eggs, if they have enough time to transition from tadpoles to frogs. There's a lot of uh, native plants, of course. You can have themes about nature in the city, um, about aquatic pollution, um, all the you know, water eventually ends up maybe flowing to the bay, and also freshwater wetlands, and so much more urban watersheds. Um, and so here's just a quick image from the uh, field trip from Little Middle School. Here we are releasing some tadpoles that we rescued from shallow ponds, and they got to take them to one of our two um, uh, most improved ponds that are the best habitat. And so um, the other aspect is the Wildlife Valley Stewards Program. This is a weekly volunteer program that I lead. Um, and the main activities are um, ditch creek restoration, so invasive plant removal along the banks of the creeks, and invasive plant removal elsewhere um, along the trail, and enhancement of native vegetation. We do some transplanting, and some native planting has been done in the past. And we pick up a lot of trash that ends up um, blowing around or being in this area to you know, just make sure it doesn't end up going in the water and eventually in the bay and also making these paths more enjoyable and beautiful. And we get so much support from the Public Works Department, so we're very grateful to them. And the proposal that we are presenting today, f asking for your support for this next year, is to um, provide funding so we can expand this program um, to work in four new um, areas besides this area at Cypress Lane. Um, if that it's to be approved by the Public Works um, Department. And um, to also have an aspect of this work be planting native vegetation. So um, in total it would be $10,000. About 3,500 of that is for 1,000 native plants directly from San Bruno Mountain that will be planted by volunteers from Brisbane and other local communities in the valley along the trail. And the rest of that would be for just um, the weekly program salary for for the about five hours a week that it takes to to host the event, about two hours of the actual event, then time to load tools, take them back, and also do outreach to the community to bring people out and, and volunteer. And so um, that's the Wild Wild Valley Stewards program. And the other aspect of 
this being, so this is of course the re restoration aspect, and the next aspect is what I term um, restoration. So restoring the valley, bringing back the stories and the interesting history that is found in this place, and making the walking experience also touch on that. And um, I've started doing a little bit of archival research and found some really interesting things about this valley. Um, I'm still new to Brisbane, so of course I, I'm still learning so much, and most of the knowledge is here in the community. And so one aspect that I'd like to do um, is do oral histories, collect oral histories from local people who maybe were around before Crocker Park got developed and after as well, um, and collaborate with interested individuals from the city of Brisbane who want to um, be involved in this community-based history effort and uh, also other lo local historians who have done historical work in Brisbane in the past. Um, so the community-based aspect and the archival research, I've already done a little bit of um, visits to the Bancroft Library and the Environmental Design Archives at UC Berkeley and found some interesting uh, maps and photographs and text and newspaper um, articles from, from the past that cover all parts of the history of the valley. And um, the City of Brisbane also has their own archives here at City Hall. And some ultimate um, ideas of what this could turn into would be perhaps a walking guide booklet that people could take as they stroll around the, the trail here in Crocker Park. Um, even better interpretive panels that could be installed at key points along the trail, scenic points covering all sorts of material from the mountain to the history of the valley to the frog area, um, to the landscape architecture of Crocker Industrial Park to how it was developed, um, and also perhaps information for the city of, of Brisbane that could be um, put up there so people can learn more about the history of, of the valley and the, um, and just to consider a proposal to perhaps in the future if this were to, to go through to think about renaming the Crocker Park Recreational Trail to the Guadalupe Valley Trail which I believe has more interpretive power and depth as Crocker Park is a crucial part of the recent history of the valley but it's been a valley for millennia and, and that way you can tell more stories and engage people in a lot of different things as they're walking through this valley. And just a quick slide that I wanted to include about um, some images, historic images. Uh, here is Guadalupe Valley after it was uh, scraped and a lot of earth was moved and actually used to make the bypass that goes by Candlestick Park. And so... Um, well, that's not Vladimir Putin. <laughs> 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 I don't believe so, but uh, <laughs> you can see that the valley is uh, scraped away and ready for business. And the image next to it is part of the same pamphlet that I started with, um, opened up, and it's the Crocker uh, company advertising the valley, so it's showing, enticing people that this valley can be reached by plane, by train, by bus, by bridge, um, and so a lot of interesting historical material that, that is uh, possibly not actually here in the city of Brisbane, but both those things actually found at UC Berkeley and that um, I would want to share with the city as part of, as part of this. And so um, to conclude, just the, the overarching theme that connects everything together is that um, we have this amazing valley that is at the heart of, of, of Brisbane. Um, and it, the trail there connects the central Brisbane with the new Brisbane neighborhoods, with the um, business community in Crocker Park, and so many students, uh, people of all ages use this trail. And so how can we connect people to each other through this amazing walking trail to their surroundings, to the mountain, um, and also make it a better place for the non-human uh, living things that still call Guadalupe Valley home. And so thank you so much. Um, I'd love to take any questions or, or thoughts that you may have. All right, anybody have any questions for yeah, Ariel? Yeah. Okay. yeah, thank you, Ariel. It's a, it's a very nice presentation. Um, took me back a few of those pictures. <laughs> No, um, I just wanted to ask on um, your income sources. You laid out your little yeah. spreadsheet here, <coughs> mm -hmm. and uh, for local business sponsorships, you, you, you put two two thousand dollars. Is that so? What, uh, how, how are you? So the the idea is the the basic amount of money that we need to just continue this program is the the ten thousand that we're asking for the city and that keeps the volunteer program going and also includes more native plantings. Um, the additional funds that are there for things like education, having the capacity to host more field trips for local schools in Brisbane, not just Lipman but ideally ele elementary schools as well. 
um, and the, the funding for also the time that it would take to, for example, take oral histories from local citizens and tra transcribe that. Um, all that funding is separate, and that's, that's more of the, um, the ideal wholesome vision of this initiative, that we're seeking um, ulterior support from, for example, local businesses or other um, individuals who want to contribute to this. Sure. So that's where, where that funding would come from, is I'd like to go to different businesses in Crocker Park, well explain. It seems like you can get more out of local businesses than what I was. Uh, yeah, no, I'm definitely going to try that, and I, I definitely want to go yeah. talk to them and, and hopefully get as much as possible, because if you get more funding from them, that means you know we could plant more plants along the trail, beautiful native plants from the mountain to beautify the trail and increase its habitat. So we definitely want to make a big effort to get the local businesses involved and show them how this is increasing um, the value uh, around their properties, you know, having a more um, meaningful place for their employees to take a rest. And even just two minutes resting and, and walking outside of the office really does make a difference. I know for me, when I see something like a beautiful wildflower, it makes my day more special. Mm, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. yeah. Well, thank you for your presentation. It was um, <coughs> really informative, and it, it's so interesting to see the pictures of what it looked like before the buildings were there yeah that picture from santa clara street that's just amazing to see what it looked like as an actual valley yeah <laughs> between mountains you know. it was shocking to see so just how open it was and uh what's really cool as well as some of the historic maps you see the outlines of the old salt marsh you see the outline of the old creek that used to go through the valley and some of the tributaries that would come down from the hills and so um there's so many resources that are there to tell a really good story and um, some stories that actually I even shared with, with some uh, longtime folks from Brisbane that they hadn't heard, one that if I can share briefly is I actually found a, a map from around 1910, and it was a proposal. Um, they had thought of uh, this valley as a possible location for the site of the Panama Pacific International Exhibition in 1915, and it ended up being, um, of course, now more in the Presidio, but I actually found the map in the Bancroft Library where they had the layout of uh, you know where the exhibitions would be, probably extending out into the bay. And so um, this valley is not just a treasure of natural resources, but it's a treasure of stories that anyone walking there would, would uh, really uh, you know, have their minds blown. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, so you, you talked about um, expanding the, the creek restoration um, beyond Cypress Lane. So what are the areas um, that you're hoping to target? So the four areas, um, they were chosen. The first one that you have on the, on the report there, I believe, is the one by Littman Middle School that I just called Littman Creek. Okay. Um, that one, I was thinking, just because it's so right below the school, it would be a really cool way to involve the school directly um, just below them. A lot of the students walk there when they're going to school or after school. And uh, I've seen some of the students actually going to Owl and Buckeye Canyon looking for frogs. But if we can improve those areas, um, those areas as well, um, one thing that we'd like to do is actually make the um, creek channels more visible. So in some areas, they're really overgrown by invasive Himalayan blackberry. And um, for example, Lawrence Halpern, who was one of the landscape architects who designed Guadalupe Valley, one of the things that he was really in favor of was having the um, archetypal, archetypal elements of human contact with nature being really present in any type of landscape experience. And so having the, the water just be more visible, people being able to see the sound of the water more when the rain is rushing, we, that area you want to kind of open it up more and just make the water more visible. Um, the other area that's going up the trail from there is the South Hill Stream. Um, that area I chose, the, the creek there isn't as big. The reason I was thinking of that area is because it actually has a nice grassland slope uh, with some native wildflowers that I saw, but also some invasive plants like French broom. And so I was wanting to um, remove some of that broom and then ideally with some of the funding for native plants, plant more native wildflowers so that not only do people walking on this trail get the experience of the wetlands and the riparian zones, but they get to see close up some of the native grasslands that are also found on the mountain. The next area that is follows from that, I believe, is what I um, called... Uh, Quarry uh, Creek. Quarry Creek, exactly. So Quarry Creek is... Um, up behind some of the businesses like Buy Right. Um, we <coughs> did an initial event with approval of the city in January. We did a whole bunch of trash removal, filled up some big dumpster boxes, and also pulled out a lot of invasive plants. And in terms of the creek, actually, that creek there is the most, um, I'd say, like, has the most habitat 
space around it. it. It's not just a channel, but it has a lot of land on either side, whereas a lot of the other channels in the valley um, are really close to the trail or are bounded by parking lots. So that, that trail, um, that creek, um, actually gets some of its water from uh, Devil's Arroyo and from, and from the mountain, I believe. And so it has more direct co water coming off the mountain, and um, it's what people might think of more as, might recognize more as, as a creek, it's closer to the mountain. And it's, um, it's part of the, the trail that's less used, but it's still used by some people there that, that we know that go out there. And it's also where uh, part of the train tracks used to also go, go around there. So okay. that's the other spot. And then the last spot was um, one just uh, uh, on the opposite side of, of Cypress Lane. We have one on the east side, and this is west of Cypress Lane. Um, the creek on the other side of Cypress Lane actually has a really nice channel and with some amazing, really lush, bountiful rushes that grow in the channel. But the same problem is that um, the channel is being blocked by pretty much a wall of broom. And so people walking by don't see um, the splendor of those mature rushes in the creek. And so mainly, and because that's also really close to Cypress Lane, we want to work in that area because we, we can um, give the frogs more of a corridor to have more space besides the two main ponds where they're found right now. Yeah, interesting, because, you know, I've walked on that trail many times, and I, I didn't even realize that the creek followed the trail. Mm -hmm. You can't hear it or see it necessarily. Yeah, um, exactly. All parts of it. And that's the amazing story of how it's, you know, it follows the trail because it used to follow the train tracks. It was just an old ditch 40 years ago, and now seed coming down from the mountain in water and sunlight, the ingredients of life, have made this amazing resurgence of the spirit of the valley and of the mountain. Yeah, so I have a question, maybe this is for Randy. Um, I know we've talked about the trail itself, the rail spurs being, you know, hard to bike or put a stroller on, and, you know, they can be hard if you're running. So is there anything in the budget for that work to restore or pave over or do something to make it more walkable or usable? We always yeah. include a small amount of money in there every year for that, ma'am. But it's on the order of like ten grand. Okay. And what kind of work is anticipated or proposed? To harden the trails? Yeah. It, specifically that. So basically what we do is we just bring in a type of aggregate material that has more fines in it, uh -huh. and then we drag it and scrape it into the existing and then wet, wet it and then roll it a little harder. So it compacts a little tighter. Okay. So would that allow bicycles to be used more easily on that trail? I, I think we're at the point where that's, we've got quite a bit of it done, ma'am. I, I oh, okay. It seems a lot of it feels like it's, it's much okay. more easily used, yeah, by bikes. Okay. Yeah, I tried it on my bike once maybe a year ago or so. <laughs> yeah, the original <laughs> stuff that was out there was pretty rough, yeah. Yeah, and, and also there weren't that many people, so just, you know, from a sense of s personal safety, I felt like it was a little deserted, and so I'd, I'd love to see more people out there using it, especially people who work there. Um, and, you know, one, one of my thoughts was, you know, if we could get this mural project going at some point, um, there's lots of wall spaces out there, um, so I can en just envision, you know, having murals reflecting, you know, the history of this area, um, just creating more ambiance um, uh, and making, making it m more friendly, and I think that, that would complement it really well. Mm -hmm. um, so. And renaming the, the trail, what would that entail? To Maybe this is a question for staff, to name it Guadalupe Valley Trail? What, how, what is that? What's the process for renaming the, the trail? So we don't actually have a process right now. Parks and Recreation Commission is in the middle of developing a recommendation to the City Council for how to name parks and recreational facilities and areas. Mm -hmm. And we will bring that to the City Council at their July 14th meeting for the policy on how to name facilities. Okay. Okay. And the private donor, is that, um, maybe you, you had asked about that, Clark, is that, um, like, w is there one donor that you have in mind, or where did you come up with that, that amount? And, and um, uh, the <laughs> private donor is um, a person who's expressed interest in, in the channels there, that they walk there often, and, um, Again, the, the, the money besides it's 10000 from the city is more our ideal hope. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was the amount that we thought they, they, could, they could provide, um, that they 
add into that, I, I can't confidently say whether they'll provide it or not, as I don't know how much money the businesses will give. Um, so more of what I can say is just the what the what this money that the city would provide would be for the actual restoration program, and if we get more funding um, from other private donors or. It could be more than one. Um, if we share more of the story of, of this place, um, then we could do more of, of the other aspects of the project. But mm -hmm. I'm not sure if, they're, if, if they would give that. It, it would be our hope that they would support it because they've been supporters in the past of the work. Um, but they're a local Brisbane resident. Okay. Um, yeah, it seems to me that reaching out to the businesses that are there, you know, to that would, I'm sure, appreciate having their employees be able to use the space would Mm -hmm. That'd be something that they would hopefully be willing to support. Yeah, so I'd definitely encourage you to reach out through the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and what's the the total budget cost um, for like the entire project? Is that it says twenty thousand dollars or? Is yeah, the the budget. Um, I think the most firm part of the, of the budget is just the 10000 for the city of Brisbane. That's the most concrete, you know, the actual restoration work, the actual planting. 20000 would be um, for um, about, let's see, about 3000 of that going to um, have the capacity to have more fuel trips. So whenever, um, for example, Littman came out for the field trip of about 25 students, I prepared an advanced curriculum for them and whole activities and that sort of thing. And I'd like to reach out to more um, schools to bring them out to the to the area. Um, I only work part time, 20 hours, and, uh, and like I mentioned, most of my time is actually spent um, on the mountain with endangered butterflies and endangered plants. And so, um, to increase the capacity to host more field trips, um, the 3,000 for outreach and education would be so just we can have more of an educational curriculum. Um, then the rest of the of the funds would be for the um, history project. And this is very loose. I, the, the budget was, um, this version was made by a, a board member um, for Mountain Watch. And I think it's, um, besides the 10,000 from the city, the rest is just more of like a thought or an, an idea. Um, it's very loose to changing. And as is this whole initiative, I, I definitely would want to collaborate closely with all the appropriate um, uh, staff from th from the city, so I think the rest of the of the of the money to go to twenty thousand is just the ideal for um, researching, um, going trips to the archives, um, writing the oral histories, um, travel to those archives, for example, and um, if there were to be interest in having some type of interpretive um, gut walking guide or in the future maybe um, installing interpretive panels, then just funding for designing those in a sense, but. Yeah, I'd say the the firm ten thousand is what we can account for every single hour, and the other ten thousand is our ideal hope of how we can make this initiative really wholesome and kind of have all aspects of it. Um, but we at least want to continue doing the important restoration work and keeping the areas um, in good quality for the frogs and for the people who enjoy them. Great, thank you. Chris, Madison. Well, I don't have any questions, but Ariel, that was a great presentation. I feel like I learned so much. You know what? I really wanted to know what type of frog that was there because at Mission Blue, you can always hear them. I never know where they're coming from. And so I'm so happy that I got to see a picture. I can't tell you, like, I'm a, I was really happy about that. So, and the photos, like, I noticed that you took most of these photos. So just great job. You really have a knack for that. And, um, yeah, I'm just so impressed. And um, it sounds like your job is really fun. Like, it yeah, probably doesn't feel it. like a job every day. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It's It's been, yeah, this week has been really, really busy. And I have a program tomorrow at 9 a.m. at Pukai Canyon, but it's uh, it's really a dream job to be here. This mountain is one of the most special places on earth, and it's surrounded by a wonderful community. So, And if you, to identify these frogs, so two characteristics, so you can um, know that this is a Pacific chorus frog that they all have, is they have a, a black band along their eye that you can see there, and also they have toe pads. And so that's what makes uh, the chorus frog the Pacific chorus frog. There's actually debate about three subspecies that are um, the Sierra and chorus frog, and one in Baja California, and one more in Northern California. So the biologists are always debating about whether are they one species or three different species. But in general, they're super common frogs that will be found in all types of habitats. They're super resilient, whether in an urban backyard or deserts, mountains, all elevations. They're um, really special. And they're also food for the snakes. And so, you know, more 
more water, more tadpoles, um, more flowers, native plants, more um, pollinators for, well, more food for the frogs, and more frogs, more food for the snakes, and more snakes, more fun for the snake enthusiasts like the little boys that were there. <laughs> well, yeah. I have to say, I didn't think at our budget meeting today that I would learn about frogs. So what a great treat. Um, I feel like you've really inspired me. I want to go out there and really spend more time. I think a lot of times, you know, we can take for granted where we live and how we have a, such an amazing, um, you know, habitats near us and uh, we're a biodiversity hotspot. And, and I feel like I really want to take uh, more advantage of that and explore that. So it's really exciting to kind of know the places that you're talking about and the things that um, you should look out for. And I think there's so much more appreciation that happens when you know what you're looking at. And it's not just a frog, it's a certain certain type of frog and um, about the different species and the debate about that. And um, in a sense, it almost makes me a little bit sad because you see those pictures of what it looks used to look like and it, what I could give to, you know, see what Brisbane looked like then. Um, and, and if we had that now, I think that'd be amazing. But, you know, times have changed. So I'm really interested to see more about the history that, that you explore. And um, I can't wait, you know, hopefully you'll be making another presentation to us pretty soon with, with your findings. So just a great job. And thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'd love to be back, and I'd also love to go on a walk with you if you want to go on the yeah. Horse Frog area. We can do a whole uh, city council and mayor walk. Yeah. And, uh, let's do it. Let's do it soon while the frogs are still out. Um, okay, great. <laughs> sure. I want to echo Madison because um, I really enjoyed um, the fact that you gave us a slide presentation that was concise and came to the point and really showed what this project could do. And he also gave us some written material that, you know, is really standalone and was entertaining to read. And I think you really have a knack for it. Yeah. So if someone is going to get this project off the ground, I think that you would do a very good job and, and are a good salesman because you have a love and a passion <laughs> for the area. I've been out on the mountain and I've worked in both the frog area and I've walked the trails and I've pulled weeds on the mountain. And there is nothing that gives you more respect for the natural environment than being out there and touching the plant, whether it's to rip out a weed or to enjoy the beauty of something. And I think that letting children know and doing the educational outreach for both the children and the adults and getting people hands on it, it, it works with some of our goals for sustainability. It works with our goals for education, recreation, and economic development. Um, you know, it makes it a more attractive area, and it has benefits in a lot of ways. So um, I really wish you luck with this and really hope that we're able to support it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ariel, for the presentation. It was very well put together, and you, you had a very strong argument. You articulated, you know, where the money would be spent and how it would benefit the community. And so, um, yeah, bravo. I mean, it was very well done. Um, yeah, you know, it's one of those things that we'll, we'll uh, take in as we evaluate the rest of the budget. But um, I thought you did a fantastic job. Oh, thank you so much for your kindness. Thank you. I really appreciate it. All right, so um, moving on, we have uh, police department. Boy, after all that. <laughs> <laughs> got a hard act to follow. Yeah, you to to fill. You got some. You got some photos for us. No. <laughs> some frogs. Fun. No, fo no frogs. No animal pictures. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I maybe have pictures of my dogs on my phone. <laughs> Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Uh, we have the Police Department budget. So we'll start with, there we go, Department Programs, the Police Department Programs that uh, meet the Council goals. We have Community Building, which uh, programs fall within that, is Public Education, Citizen Engagement, and Patrol Services. Then we go down to Management, 
Um, we have department management, records management, and workforce development. And then lastly, we have the goal of safe community. How do we um, meet or, or have a safe community we, that encompasses the program of emergency response, investigations, patrol services, traffic enforcement, and records management. So the funding by program, um, you could see that the biggest um, cost item there is the patrol services, and then the rest kind of all fall into play. And then our program highlights. Um, as you recall, we came to council um, this year for our code enforcement officer. It was once budgeted and funded by the community development department and that got moved over to the police department. And we now currently um, oversee the code enforcement program. Uh, currently, Commander Meisner is still in, um, is overseeing and also working in the development of the code enforcement program. So I'm going to have him come up and tell you a little bit, provide you a little bit of an update on the actual program itself. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. As you recall, last year we received Council approval to hire a part-time code enforcement officer to work under the supervision of the Police Department. Uh, the initial implementation of this plan has been a tremendous success and one of the things key things that we've learned moving forward is that the workload required to execute this program successfully cannot be accomplished with only one part-time code enforcement officer and it's for that reason that we've requested this position be full-time uh, so far after a lengthy recruitment process we're able to hire michelle moneda uh, who's been a tremendous asset to the program uh, we went to work developing the code enforcement program with the goal of providing the best possible service to the public based on our motto of in partnership with the community. On the onset, our focus has been on the building and planning department, and this began with locating, researching, and follow up, following up on open cases, developing software tools to document and track complaints, investigations, and citations, and developing procedures to ensure the proper flow of information among city staff. Most importantly, this included personal outreach into the community to resolve citizen complaints or other code enforcement violations. The feedback and results of this new methodology has been outstanding. This cooperative approach to a process that can be intimidating to our citizens has in fact been a means to tear down the walls between us and the community. In addition, we've been able to offer assistance to those that may have not received it otherwise for example, within the first month, we opened two different cases involving hoarding. As I'm sure you're all aware, these cases can be a strain to the quality of life to those around them. More importantly, these cases cannot be resolved with a simple letter or a citation from the city as they often, often involve emotional issues with the persons involved. Success is only obtained by developing a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship, allowing us to coordinate the resources necessary to get them the help they need. And it's this type of service that we want to deliver throughout the community. Some other examples of building and planning related cases the code enforcement officer will handle are illegal construction, building and construction without a permit, violations of building code standards, illegal living units, including vehicles parked in driveways, homeless encampments, lack of adequate garbage service, illegal outbuildings, faulty sewer or illegal discharge into the storm drain, mold issues, setback violations, and hazardous conditions such as unsafe walkways, deck stairs, or other construction. What we've learned so far is that we've only scratched the surface regarding what services a code enforcement officer can offer to the community. And because of our initial success, we've come to understand that managing just building and planning issues is a part-time endeavor just on its own. Therefore, so far, we have not been able to move forward with incorporating the police-related code enforcement concerns, which is one of our original goals in shifting the supervision to the police department. Some examples of police-related concerns we hope to be more proactive toward in the future are abandoned vehicles, private property abatements, public nuisances, dumping complaints and cleanup, noise complaints, both industrial and residential, illegal signs, posters, or handbills, graffiti, solicitors, and sales without proper license, animal licensing, barking dog and lease law violations, and business license violations. We feel that this position has already become a shining star for the police department and the city government as a whole. We are excited about the possibilities moving forward as we continue to develop this program with the emphasis of providing personal 
and professional service to the community in all aspects of code enforcement. Any council have questions about the program so far? I have some at the end, so okay. you, you, you still have some more. So some of the other highlights include uh, we have re-implemented our motorcycle detective and SRO program. If you recall last year um, during our bu budget presentation, we promised council that if we were to fill our staffing goals, that we would uh, fill those positions. And we thank council for your support as we have reached our staffing goals and we have filled those positions. And then the last one is the replacement of um, the car laptops and, uh, and docks. Um, those were on our rotational capital improvement plan and because of during the, re the recession and tough times we've actually put those off for several years so there is a need um, it gets to a point where there no it's no longer cost efficient to continue to to fix them and um, it's time to replace them and that concludes our presentation we're available for questions if council has yes, I do. clerk yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Bob. I know it's uh, been a long time coming since you've been fully staffed. And for years, I was always concerned about that. <laughs> um, on the laptops, did, you know, I, I think originally we had applied for grants way back when. And did we try and do any grants as far as doing replacements on the laptops? Or no, we have not. We didn't apply no. for any, any no, type of not. grants. Or do we intend to? You know what? I don't think. Do, I, don't, I don't remember if the last grant was that a um, cops grant. I don't recall. It was yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, it might be something to just check into. You sure, know, absolutely. You know, we can do that. Absolutely. Could end up saving us. 50,000 bucks, you know. No, absolutely. We can look into that. But uh, also, you know, um, I know in uh, um, uh, Clay's presentation or Stewart's last night, I wasn't here, but I, I happened to be watching remotely. I was here via text with Clay. Um, but you were talking about uh, doing rifle replacements, and that doesn't look like it's in this, uh, it, it is in this year's budget, right? 16, 17. And those are the uh, AR-15s you're talking about? That's correct. The, the ones I think that you demonstrated back when you were an officer. Yes, I was actually, it was 1995, and I was pregnant um, with my with my oldest daughter. Yeah, yes. yeah, 1995, because yes. it was right after the LA incident, the loss. That's oh, correct. We're talking yes. 21 years ago. So yes. yeah, I remember you, you doing well. the <laughs> Yes, we transitioned from the shotguns to the rifles. <clears throat> right, and they were um, shorter and uh, of a normal AR-15 or military style. M16, I guess it's the Correct. same body style, right? And so, yes. um, so those are the ones that you're wanting to replace. Yes, they saying? usually, um, based on our our recommendations from our both of our um, our firearms instructors, um, rifles usually have a life of 10 to 12 years, uh -huh. and they are now well beyond their their life. Um, and the weapon has be you know becomes compromised after you know it's either. I think it was 6,000 rounds um, or 10 years is usually the recommendation. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of things come into play. They're, they're stored in the vehicle, so the moisture, they start to rust. So it is, we've, we've again pushed them out um, as long as we could, and now it's time to, to look at the replacement. So, so what, what do you do with the, uh, the old ones? How do you we, recycle them? We actually uh, sell them back, so there's, it's a buyback program. Oh, okay. So we will get some funding, some money back for those. So is there is that an offset to tw the twenty eight grand? Is that a, yes? It's an offset? Yes. Yes. So that's that's what the flat. That's price what, the, is, what the yes that is included. Mm -hmm. Yes. And when we, and when you talk about optics, uh, what what is that? Is it like scopes on those? Is that those are the scopes? Yes. Are they they all have scopes. Or? Yes, oh, okay. they all do. All right, very good. Um, yeah, I mean, the unfortunate incident that happened in. Uh, Orlando this past weekend you know I mean I remember um, 95 the LA bank robbery Bank of America and the, the, the two suspects that came in heavily armed it you know caused a lot of a lot of police departments to uh, um, 
to look at their weaponry. With automatic yes. weapons, you know, because you had to. You can no longer go with a, a Smith and Wesson revolver, <laughs> you know. So everything is it's all changed. Yes. A, a few nut jobs out there, but uh, yeah, I'd certainly support that. I wouldn't, you know, I, I'd, I'd hope. Yeah, we, I think we said this 21 years ago that you'd never have to use them on duty, you know, yeah. that, but you want your officers prepared. We want them to be well versus, prepared. Versus, you know, not having, not being prepared, because I remember uh, uh, Officer Dave Shakuti of uh, Millbrae, the motorcycle officer, mm. stopped a guy, pulled him over in the van, and he came out with a, a AK-47 fully automatic, right? the guy didn't have a chance, you know, and they shot him down. You are correct. Crazy. It's true. You remember that well. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so how's things going with all the staffing and stuff? And it's going very well. Thank you. Yes. Um, we're very excited that we have our motorcycle. Uh, both of our motorcycle positions are, fu are full. One of them is currently, it was our our past uh, motor officer who resubmitted for the position. And so he was able to go back out on the street with just an updated course. But our second officer that put in for the uh, position is still going to motor school. So it's mm -hmm. that's been a little delayed on the second position. But we currently have one that's out uh, working working traffic. Okay. Now, years ago, we used to have a bicycle out there, too. And, uh, are there any plans on doing that? Yes. As a matter of fact, I remember having the conversation with uh, Mayor Lentz. Yes, we recently purchased a, motor, a bicycle, and we are getting it outfitted. So w during the summer, no. you will see one of our officers out um, at, in our visitation, in our, uh, during, in our also in our Cro Crocker Air Industrial Area, as well as the village and even down at the marina. So it will be nice to get that um, bicycle officer out there. Again, there's some training that's involved, but it's exciting to, to see that up and coming. I remember uh, the one call the guy got. He was up like on Sierra Point or Humboldt, and he got down the hill so fast on the bicycle, <laughs> he just went zoop. <laughs> he actually beat the cars there. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> It's been a while. Shorts and <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's been a while since we've had the bicycle, but yeah. I know that the businesses yeah. will enjoy having it out there. Well, good. As well I'm as the, the community. That, yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Uh, Laura? I don't have any questions. Uh, Terry? On uh, page 130 of your budget, in, under professional services, we have a dramatic increase in cra crime lab fees in the budget. Is there some reason we expect that to go? To, yes. Triple, double? Yes. yes. As we have, well, prior to that, as you'll see, the numbers were low. But when you have, when you, we had less officers, you become more reactive. You may become more reactive. You're responding to calls. Now, as we have a full staff, your officers are out there being proactive. So there's more drug arrests. There's more crime that's being, um, that, officers are in county so we're having more more crime lab fees um, this one in particular we you know just in alone in the with the Titchener case that that one's going to go way over our budget so it just takes a few big cases it's going to put us over our number so we thought we would prepare in advance but just with uh, again with the staffing numbers we're seeing more arrests and there's more um, there's more crime more crime analysis that need to be done so we don't anticipate additional um, uh, jail fees or anything from that? No. Many of the jail fees are covered through a, a different, a separate grant through the sheriff's office, so they can continue to stay at a lowered cost. So that shouldn't be affected. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I have no questions. All right, uh, Lisa, thank you for the presentation. You know, I do have... Um, one question, and, and it's it, and I know that uh, you know in the past when we had the the Great Recession and we had to tighten our belt, and you know we weren't hiring new officers, and then, and then recently we've been hiring new officers. Um, just kind of briefly, kind of walk us through the, the increase in 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 the budget that you're asking. So uh, I'm looking at say 2013, 2014. This is under um, the um, patrol, and uh, so we had two what page point, uh, 128. 28. Yeah. So in the 2013, 2014, we had uh, about 2.2 .2 million. 
now we're looking at 2017, 2018, and it's it's a million dollars more. So, um, and, and you know the, the you know the question that Terry asked, you know, okay, here's the the the, um, the lab fees going up or costs going up, and then that and then the answer you gave totally makes sense. You 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 have more arrests, and and then you know there are other things that are involved to to finalize certain things. So if you could kind of give us a, you know, walk us through why there's a, a million dollar increase over the last um, four years. I'm sure some of it has to do with with just salaries in itself right. and benefits. And I think that's probably, if I'm not mistaken, Stuart, that's probably Right. So if you look at the 2013-2014 actuals, um, it was 1,378 for salaries. We're projecting 1,700,000 this year. And then also, if you look at the benefits line item, it was 472,000, and this year we're projecting 928,000. So you have the increase in PERS costs, and if you remember last year when we talked about it, mm -hmm. <coughs> PERS is now doing something slightly differently, where they're doing their unfunded liability as a separate line item. So that's part of that. In so that was part of the increase that came in last year. That's going to be continuing for a number of years, as we talked about with PERS. There's been the increase in the health insurance rates over the past few years, the additional officers, you know, they having, you know, a number of them have families, so their cost for health insurance is at the higher end, not at the lower end. So it's just a lot of, you know, I think if you look at the two numbers, 300 or almost, yeah, 300,000 is coming in from salaries, um, another 400,000, 450,000 is coming in from the benefits, and then the services and supplies is another 70,000. So it's not really in the services and supplies. You know, as we talk about the cost of officers, you know, I think this was brought up last night when we were talking about adding additional firefighters. Is it less expensive to have a f have overtime or to have a firefighter? F you know, police public safety is expensive because you have the health insurance as well as the PERS and it comes to more than 50, you know, more than 50% of their costs are in benefits. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. So you know, you you you're, you and your staff are doing an amazing job, Lisa, and you know the community. You know, feel safe and and um, and well protected. So thank you. Well, thank you. We have a great um, department. Everybody's very enthusiastic, very motivated. It's nice to to see that and have the ability to go out there and do real proactive policing. So we I thank council for all of your support in our allowing us to get our staffing levels up. Absolutely. All right, thank you, Lisa. Great, thank you. Okay, um, next up, City Attorney Michael. Do we do we want to extend the meeting? Uh, yes, let's let's uh, shoot for eleven o'clock, and I'm okay. sure we'll get done. A prior motion to, to extend it to ten thirty-five. It is ten thirty-five. Oh. Ten thirty-four. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I see what you did there. All right, there. so eleven o'clock, Clark. You good with that? Eleven o'clock. That's yeah. your motion. Do I have a second? Eleven. Just kidding, Michael. I thought you were oh, going to be oh, second. <laughs> okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, Michael. All right. Well, this hopefully will go fairly. What have we got there? Okay. There. All right. I'm going to have me look at this thing. Um, as we entered the, I think just the beginning of the, the fourth year of the, the contract with, uh, with the city, between the firm and the city, I think it's been going very well. I think the things that we've been trying to do, uh, clearly we provide the legal support for the, the city and the city council and the staff. I think one of the things that we were trying to do this year was to try to get the, uh, the budget a little bit under control, uh, that we felt we had to come back with a budget amendment last year to increase it. I think when, when you look at what the budget will actually be this year, it will be a significant drop in what was spent last year. And I think that's reflected in the upcoming budget for this coming year as well. Um, I think we're doing a, a good job of maintaining the cost, being being efficient, yet getting the legal services that the uh, the council wants. Uh, we are asking in this budget for 283 250, which is about $200,000 less than what was budgeted last year, as I indicated. Um, I don't think, not $200,000, $20,000 less than what was budgeted last <laughs> wow. year. Um, 
and I think this year's budget is going to come in much less than the three hundred thousand dollars. I mean, to support Michael on that one, um, we were running twenty-five thousand dollars a month, if you remember, and maybe more in some months for legal services. The last two or three months, maybe even four months, we've been in the ten to twelve thousand dollar range. So even that two hundred eighty-three thousand has a large level of cushion, depending on what issues the city council brings to the city uh, city attorney and as you know th this is one of another one of those areas where you know if the money is not spent it just falls back into fund balance and you know it's a savings to the city we're not going to spend money without having the hours being used and I try to be very conscientious of that and I think it's reflected in what we've been doing certainly uh, we've spent a fair amount of time this year on the Baylands there's been a number of uh, hearings before the Planning Commission. That money fortunately does not come out of the city's general fund. That money is being funded by the developer, mm -hmm. but it's nevertheless, you know, we do devote a certain amount of time to that project. We did do the, uh, uh, the various iterations of the smoking ordinance that went to the council several times. Um, we finally now are going to be in position, as I understand it, to bring back the regulations concerning the multifamily units. That's sort of been vetted now, and we will be bringing that back to the council in September or October. Uh, the council has also asked us to look at some rent control issues. I've been uh, just coincidentally very involved with that uh, in other communities, so I have a fair amount of knowledge about that. So the, the fact that the council wants to pursue that, uh, you will have the advantage of, uh, uh, of my expertise and knowledge in rent control issues. So with that, uh, I will be glad to answer any questions about any other projects we've worked on. I, we will be having an evaluation uh, on June 30th, which I will go in much more detail in terms of what we accomplished and what we hope to accomplish in the upcoming year. Any questions for Michael? Uh, I, I do. I have yeah, one. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Um, does this include any anticipated legal fees from the Kinder Morgan mm. issues? The answer is no. That is being paid out of a separate fund that the city has set aside for these type of projects or these type of litigation. And again, that the cost of that uh, will be a subject matter that will be discussed in closed session with the council probably in July 14th. Okay, and and for Stuart, where would that show up in our budget? That, that is uh, comes out of our liability fund. Uh, it's not specifically called out because there is at this point in time no um, definitive cost to it, but we set aside. Um, money every year, uh, hoping never to use it. Um, we pay for our insurance out of it, but we also have money for our self-insured um, items, such as the Kinder Morgan. So we have enough money in reserves to cover that cost. Great, thank you. Mark, question's been answered. <laughs> okay. So, um, as a follow-up, Stuart, so does that liability fund? Is that where? Um, the fees come from for any potential litigation or or any claims against the city? Yes, for any claims against the city. So okay. if you turn, to, for instance, on page 47 of your budget document, there's a number of uh, internal service <coughs> funds that we have. Um, we, we are anticipating starting fiscal year 16, 15, 6, 16, 17 with about $416,000 in reserves. That's money that we have not out, that has been set aside in previous years to cover us for future liability issues. We budget um, liability based on payroll for the entire city. We basically, the idea being is that we assume that as the more people you have, the more staff you have, the more potential for liability you have. So as payroll goes up, as staff goes up, we set aside more money for liability issues. We then pay money for our direct insurance costs, and then we, set a, then we also anticipate spending a little bit of money for defense of items not covered through that. So we would anticipate an, you know, ending the year with about 467000 So depending on what the cost of Kinder Morgan, it would um, lawsuits or any other lawsuits that we would face, we have over four hundred thousand dollars set aside for those kinds of issues. Can I ask for a clarification on that page number? Yeah. Page forty-seven. It it's so at the tab is fund budget summary. It's called self-insurance. 
um, it's on the internal service and, fund. Um, so I'm if you look at, it's a very towards the very beginning of the budget book. Internal services. Right, internal service funds, and, and look at the self insurance. Fund six thirty. Fund six thirty. Okay. Right. Self insurance. And if you look at the next one down, workers' compensation. Yeah, you know, as you know, that that's one of those things that it's a very it has a very long tail. So we're not we have a anticipate you know our liabilities are greater at this point than the money we have set aside. Um, it just depends on what happens with those ca with those cases whether or not they you know we pay the full amount. Um, so it's not an issue from a cash perspective for us. It's just a matter of waiting for all those cases to resolve themselves, and then we will need to um, determine. At that point in time, do we? How do we take care of that negative dollar amount, if it still is there? And I know it's one of those items that we go through all the time when we're in closed session on workers' comp cases. One more question. So, um, the work that's done on the personnel updates. I know we're, we worked on. We talked about it at the subcommittee. Mm -hmm. All that the review of the employee personnel guidelines right. is that p part of this budget I mean from this not for this year's but it, I think it's, it's for the so, current we, budget, so in the human resources is that yeah the labor and well in we, we have in um, in the past we've had in human resources we have put some money aside for that we haven't you know this has been an ongoing project for us so we haven't done it recently um, but we are uh, so we have a little bit of money set aside in case for labor relations, we could take it out of that from the legal perspective, or we will take it from the city attorneys because we are using the city attorney firm, depending on what the cost is. In the, in the past, I know that when there has been, when uh, uh, Maria has used the, the firm for personnel related issues and uh, Genevieve has been used, it will sh typically show up on the, the contract city attorney budget that, you know, that I review. Um, the numbers, you know, typically haven't been excessive, uh, but that's usually where it shows up as opposed to the labor negotiations that John Holtzman has done, which is t more come out of the uh, HR budget, as I understand it correctly. Yes. Okay. So again, is this something that we can have an overarching page that breaks down all of our legal budget? I know that we, we're breaking it down into programs or, or departments in this book, but just like fire and police don't have a cover page kind of yes. line items. If yes. we could do that for legal fees, I think that would be also helpful. And, sure. I, and I think um, with the upcoming evaluation, it would be helpful to know from the, you know, the past year what have been the, the major breakdowns of categories of fees. Sure. You can do that. All right, no, thank you, Michael. Staff reports, Clay. Uh, well, and before we do the staff reports, just to kind of wrap up on the uh, kind of next steps in the budget process. So as, um, as you know, you've been receiving a number of requests from some of your boards and commissions and from a, um, a um, private nonprofit. Um, so um, what my suggestion would be would that we would uh, because of the lateness of the hour, we'll bring those back to you as a list at the next meeting. There are, there are, I think, different ways to handle some of those requests. I mean, they're all meritorious. They all have some value. Um, and it, basically for the council to make a decision on which ones you want to fund. For example, um, the uh, there's a number of, um, of capital improvements that the Parks Commission mm -hmm. recommended last year. I mean, my recommendation would be to push those off until the next year because they are um, um, we're going to do a deep dive on the capital budget at that point in time um, so they'd be on that list and you deal with it next year there are some other things that the parks commission talked about last night that i think in talking with Stuart today we feel like we probably just handled internally in terms of the the uh, the operating budget so we can identify those things there are other things such as a presentation tonight you just need to make a a decision on, um, but there's also, um, I think I mentioned in a, one of my weekly reports to you that, that there's kind of a city cost to to what was presented tonight. So um, we want to get you the full picture of what the, the program costs would for, for that would be. But anyway, we can bring that all back to you 
on the 30th and then you can uh, basically go through the list as you've done in the past years and just decide which ones you want to want to fund and that's the 30th of June and what day is our budget approval due by 30th of June well yes but there, <laughs> there's no law that requires that okay I mean that's just the fiscal year begins July 1 it's a, it's good form to do it by then but you know that that's not um, you know, uh, there, there's nothing, no, nothing happens if you don't do it on that night. So, but anyway, we will have the whole budget for you on the June 30th. We'll have the resolutions as we always do. And so if you're ready to act, we, you, you can act. Yeah, hopefully we can. Yeah. All right. Any, any other questions for, for Clay regarding the budget? Is that where, is Stuart going to play with his interactive, I, I shouldn't say play. Uh, show us what this does to the to the budget with this interactive tool. Yeah, yeah. I I, I actually think play is not such a bad word because we're going to you know have an opportunity to insert. There's a number of things that have come up here. We'll have an opportunity to insert those, and then play that out in terms of what the uh, what the impact is. Um, just one last thing that I, I think Lori was starting to get into a question of you know I think what what why were certain things in the city manager recommended budget and, and some of these other things were not. Mm -hmm. um, and in large part, um, I just made a decision that things that were coming through your boards and commissions and through your, uh, and in this case a nonprofit, um, would just um, uh, come forward directly to the council and uh, it would not be part of the city manager's budget but would be independently reviewed by the, uh, by the council because they're really not part of the, um, the existing operating budget of the city. So that's just kind of a, a way, I think, of managing the, uh, the request. Okay. And I, I guess I say that just that there's no judgment on my part that they're not, you know, that they don't have merit. I think they all do. You know, Clay, you know, it'd probably be good when you bring back um, the request from the different um, advisory groups that you also bring back your list of the things that you've recommended be added to just so they're it's all on kind of like one thing yeah I think we've we've got a list of the stuff that we've added into the budget um, and then I can give you a kind of a recommendation on maybe how to handle some of the stuff that came from your boards and commissions or from your advisory groups okay okay we'll do both of those all right thank you all right now staff reports no staff report <laughs> okay Good Mayor job. council matters anybody uh, Subcommittees and I know that Laurie and I met this evening mm -hmm. on and received a document on the facility subcommittee. Wasn't it facility subcommittee? No, policy subcommittee. I'd have to look at my Whatever agenda was, yeah. from earlier um, and discuss document retention and employee guideline I guess or yeah. it was the fiscal <coughs> excuse me fiscal and administrative policies subcommittee we discussed the police records retention policy um, which is about the police department being able to um, get rid of old documents um, we basically need a policy because there isn't one and so they have documents dating back to the 1980s in hard copies so they're gonna um, put forth a proposal on that and then we talked about the HR personnel rules and regulations, which was what was just referenced by the city attorney. Um, they've, been do they've started doing a major update of the um, per personnel rules and regulations, uh, which haven't ever been updated since they were written, I think, in 1982. Um, so that's, that's going to come, that's going to still come before the subcommittee. We just got a, a taste of what it looks like. It's a pretty big document. Um, and uh, I attended the Peninsula Clean Energy Board meeting um, last week. And uh, the PCE got approval from the CPUC on its implementation plan. Um, and we um, have come up with the branding for the different levels of um, pricing or energy that will be the, the different levels of um, you know, that will be offered. There will be. Um, the 50% option will be called Echo Plus, and the 100% renewable energy option will be called Echo 100. Um, <clears throat> and 
Um, oh, and we also are in the process of doing a marketing campaign. Um, and they were seeking volunteers for their photo shoot. Um, I volunteered, so you might see myself and my son <laughs> and my father-in-law in some pictures. Um, and uh, they're trying to get a wide um, swath of the community. Um, so they said that um, you know if we have any suggestions on luminaries, no pun intended, <laughs> uh, in our community for the photo shoot, um, you know I could probably think of a few. But if you have any suggestions on people who are really interested in the idea of the community choice aggregation, um, they would love to um, reach out to those people to include them in the photo shoot. Um, and that's basically that. And then um, oh, I attended um, earlier this week the library um, JPA board meeting. Um, and we looked at the recommended budget um, and we approved it. Um, and that'll, I think, be coming back to us once more before it goes on to the Board of Supervisors. You know, I also had an economic development. Oh, that's right. Subcommittee meeting. Talked a little bit about uh, the Parkside uh, <coughs> size plan and, um, uh, you know, some next steps. And you now that Clay has sent us some information regarding uh, getting us, you know, more information, having a more collaborative uh, public uh, uh, participation in what we finalized uh, the plan to be. And then uh, I had a commute.org meeting <coughs> this morning at 8. <laughs> Long day. Yeah. So uh, just, uh, yeah, you know, uh, it's a great organization. Of course, it's what uh, 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 manages the shuttles that we all use. And, and you know, Brisbane's still up there, but we're not the number one shuttle um, as far as uh, uh, participants. Uh, we're now second. Someone else uh, took the lead. I forgot who it was. Maria would know, of course. So that was it uh, for me. Oh, I uh, just wanted to give everybody a heads up. Uh, we're doing a roundtable, SFO roundtable, technical working group meeting in Daly City on the 22nd at 9 a.m. And uh, the last couple of days I've been writing different um, packages for flight procedures and then collaborating with uh, uh, our consultant for the roundtable as well as um, Kathleen Wentworth, who is a former pilot. She works for um, Jackie Spears' office. She's extremely uh, you know, valuable asset to the collaboration process. And so hopefully on the 22nd, we'll, we'll be presenting some, um, uh, you know, some recommendations to the FAA that will hopefully um, start the process of working with them to reduce noise. Uh, by airplanes in our community. And, and as soon as we get that draft uh, put together, I'm going to email that to um, uh, Clay and, and some of the other folks that are really involved with uh, airplane noise. And, um, and then we'll. we'll, we'll Where, where's that being held at? <coughs> the Daly City um, uh, Council Chambers. Okay. So it's at 9 a.m. on the 22nd. That's Wednesday. Yes. Yes, and then um, on the 27th, we're having a special roundtable meeting in Millbrae, and I, I, it's not at night. Usually we have the meetings at night, but a lot of uh, councils have uh, their council meetings in the evening on uh, on Mondays, and so it's going to be during the day, and I think it's at 1 o'clock. Um, and that's Monday. Mm -hmm. Yes. 27th. Terry, anything else? I don't think so. Madison? Okay. All right. Um, Written communications, I don't see any. So, um, oral communications too. Does anybody have anything they want to say that's not on tonight's agenda? All right, thank you. Um, again, uh, we're going to um, have uh, tonight's uh, uh, meeting in memory of uh, Gabriel um, Maldonado. All right, thank you for coming tonight. And, um, We'll adjourn to our next meeting, which um, June 30th. June 30th. All right. Thank you very much.